You're listening to Inside the Village, where all news is local and no topic is off limits. So help me, Bob, it's bully in the alley. Hey, bully in the alley. So help me, Bob. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Village. Alongside Michael Friscalanti, editor in chief, we call him Frisco. I'm Scott Sexsmith. Nice to see you. Great to see you, Scott. Are you settling in? Summer's just about here. Any big plans? I settle in as best I can. Uh, yeah. You know, no, we're going to uh, actually head down to southern Ontario, visit family and friends. That's the plan. Get Go through the French River trading post. <laughs> That's right. Can't wait to see Stop Tracy. Stop in and see yeah. Tracy, see how yeah. she's doing. A lot of people, by the way, were watching that uh, the, her interview. A lot yeah. of people were, were checking it out. A lot of big fans of the French River trading post. Happy to see that they're still doing well, that they're still there. Yeah, and it's not because they've got a ton of signage, because I'm sure MTO probably <laughs> hasn't done anything about sure that. Just still the homemade map. Uh, Inside the Village brought to you by True North Mortgage. True North Mortgage, where you get great advice and save a pile of cash. First word to Frisco, one of our markets, Sault Ste. Marie, a big celebration happening as Sue Today celebrates its 20th anniversary. 20 years of Sue Today. Unbelievable. Yeah, we're having uh, some uh, mo- sentimental moments thinking about how long they've been around. They've been serving the people of the Sioux for a long, long time. And I think it's fair to say that Sue Today is an anomaly. It's one of those websites that people actually go to every day, type in suetoday.com. It's like everyone does it. And especially the Suites who've left town and live in all over the world, they're checking Sue Today every day. We see the numbers. It's it's phenomenal. And uh, it's really an amazing thing. And it's just village media has grown from Sue Today. Right now we have 18 owned and operated sites all over the province. We're doing fantastic local journalism in all those markets. We're telling the stories of the people who live there, of the good, the bad, and the ugly sometimes. And uh, this podcast, the r- reminder is that, you know, we're here to, to, to share those stories, to, to, to shine a light on the great local journalism we're doing and to, uh, and to talk about issues that are affecting people in all our markets all over Ontario. And two more great stories that uh, you and I get to uh, tell today to our audience, which we will do right after this when Inside the Village returns. From newsmakers to celebrities to other prominent guests, you'll find them all on Village Media's new interview series, up close and personal. Join host Scott Sexsmith as he goes one-on-one with well-known Canadians to hear their story. Up close and personal. Look for it on your favourite Village Media website across Ontario. Welcome back to Inside the Village alongside Frisco. uh, I'm Scott. Uh, Frisco, uh, we're coming out of COVID slowly but surely. And I think it's safe to say that the last two years, uh, COVID uh, brought out many stories and some good, some not so good. And maybe from the not so good category uh, was the light that has been uh, shone on uh, long-term care facilities uh, in in the province. Well, for sure. I think everybody would agree that uh, COVID really blew the lid open on what everyone inside the long-term care industry understood that this was a disaster waiting to happen. And we saw it unfold. I believe the stats are that 4,500 of the deaths in Ontario were people living in long-term wow, care, staggering. which is just unbelievable, right? And uh, a lot of those uh, deaths people feel could have been prevented if certain things were in place. And uh, the, the long-term care issue is the subject of Village Media's latest big read. We're taking a look, uh, the reporter's taking a look, very close look at uh, a group of personal support workers in one Ontario city that are trying to find a different way to provide home care to people that, so they don't have to go into a long-term care facility and to do it in a way that also protects the workers. So it's a co-op system. It's the first PSW-owned co-op uh, home care system, home care company. And it's a really unique idea. It's getting a lot of buzz. A lot of people are watching to see if this is a way forward in communities all over Ontario and even Canada. Joined on the program now by Danielle Turpin. Danielle is the co-founder of the Home Care Workers Cooperative Incorporated based out of Peterborough and Dr. Simon Berge, Director of the Research Center of Cooperative Enterprises at the University of Winnipeg. Welcome to Inside the Village to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Danielle, I'd like to start with you, uh, if we can. You've been a PSW for uh, for the last couple of decades uh, in long-term care facilities. Can you give our listeners a bit of an insight as to the real story of what it's like inside these homes? I can. Um, I think that one of the major issues is the short staffing of our PSWs, and that equates to lack of care um, of our residents that they so desperately need. Um I don't know if I have to go into really too much detail about the horrors of long-term care, considering we hear about it all the time um, in the news. So my long-term care wasn't uh, anything different or exceptional. We had uh, outbreaks and we had lockdowns and um, we had deaths. Uh, So 
I think my main focus for doing this really was about the inadequate care that's happening in all of these facilities. And it really comes down, from my opinion anyway, it comes down to lack of resources from government um, and lack of resources to our PSWs and the staff. And that in turn just makes the quality of care um, really, really poor for our residents. Is it fair to say, Danielle, that this we kind of saw this disaster waiting to happen with COVID, that COVID, we sort, we sort of foresaw the problems to come? Like long-term care was a disaster before COVID came along is what I'm saying. Absolutely. I think there, I mean, nurses and PSWs and healthcare workers have been shouting at the top of their lungs forever about this crisis. And uh, sadly, it took the army to be coming in to these long-term care homes to actually bring awareness to this. This has been going on for decades. We are an undervalued profession. Uh, seniors are undervalued in our society and not appreciated. So um, I think it, it's been going on forever and it, something really needs to change. So you hit a breaking point and you realized that you needed to try something different and, and you, you decided you, you would try something on your own. How did you come across the co-op idea and, and tell us about how your company works? So I came across the cooperative idea. I, I think I had the idea in my head without really naming it. Um, I knew I wanted to have a fair and equitable workplace for PSWs. I wanted to make sure that they had a voice in their own work environment. Um, being an unregulated healthcare profession, it really does lead to exploitative practices with employers. So I wanted to make sure that at least in my uh, business, that wouldn't be the case and our PSWs would be protected and really valued and heard. Um, I kind of started searching different ways in different countries and different models of home care. And I came across the Ontario Cooperative Association um, and the Canadian Worker Federation of, or Cooperative Federation. Um, and I just kind of a bell went off and said, okay, I think this is it. This is my idea. Now I have a name for it. And, and how does it work? I guess it's nuts and bolts. If I'm looking for something for my mother, for example, how does it work? So the, the cooperative idea, our home care. So our home care company, um, it is uh, worker owned, it's PSW owned, um, it's a not-for-profit. So all you'd have to do if you're looking for care for your mom is to reach out and give us a call. Um, and we provide um, business and our, we provide, provide our care, sorry, based on the needs of the client. So not based on the service needs of our business. And I think that's one real big take home about the difference between the traditional companies and for-profit companies and ours. Um, so everything is based on the care needs of that individual client. We hire based on that. And our main goal really is building that meaningful relationship that establishes the trust within the care provider and the client. Um, so we are able to provide, you know, provide that quality care to our PS or to our clients. Danielle, if you could maybe explain to uh, to Frisco and I and, and and to our listeners how the how the payment schedule works. If we're looking at uh, putting one of our parents uh, in, into a facility that that falls under uh, your co-op, how does that all work? So right now we're private, not for profit. So our clients, we just invoice them based on the hours that we've serviced them, and they pay us. Um, we're not government funded, and we don't take any government contracts at this point. However, there is opportunities for direct funding to clients based on their eligibility criteria that they would meet through the LIN or community home care agencies. Mm -hmm. Simon, can I bring you into the conversation and ask, you, you've helped uh, Danielle with this. You've talked, a lot about, with, you've talked a lot to her about this idea. What's the benefit for the clients and for the workers? What's so beneficial about this idea? Uh, well, co-ops basically change the the dynamic within the system. Instead of focusing on profit and shareholder needs, co-ops focus on worker and client needs. So as Danielle mentioned, within the cooperative, they are worker owned. So it's up to the workers to vote on what care they want to provide, uh, how long they want to stay with their clients, uh, whether or not they want to create a relationship with their clients. They're not motivated by we have to get this job quickly in order to reduce costs for uh, labor uh, to ensure that shareholders get profit, right? So this provides all the workers and the clients with voices in the system. Uh, right now, the system just doesn't hear clients. It doesn't hear workers. They've been screaming for decades that this system is broken and no one's really been listening. 
Simon, how does it fit into the bigger conversation we're having? Obviously, with since COVID, everyone's sort of trying to come up with a better way to do long-term care, to do elder care in this country, because let's face it, anyone who's thinking of that they want to go into a nursing home doesn't want to go anywhere near them now, right? It's the last place they want to be. They've all seen the horrors on the news that everyone else has. So how does this fit into the bigger picture idea? How can How should governments be looking at this idea in the bigger picture of how we deal with senior care? Well, governments really should be listening to those people who are actually engaged in the system. Shareholders aren't engaged in the system, say, for profit, right? They're not putting their parents in homes uh, that they're, you know, uh, funding. They're basically looking at what they can get out of the system. Uh, Governments need to really refocus the system on what the clients want. And there's been study after study that that state that people want to age in place. They want to age at home. Uh, They don't want to go into long-term care. Uh, Our focus on institutional care, our our focus on economies of scale within those institutions really makes us think of elder care as, oh, we're putting them in a hospital, not a home, not a home setting. And we really need to change that. Uh, Denmark is an excellent example of that, where they create communities of care, um, multi-generational communities, where everyone looks after each other, right? And supports are there for the elderly. We don't grab, they don't, sorry, they don't grab the elderly out of their homes and say, okay, now we've got to put you all together in this institution where we can provide that care. They actually do that in place in their home. Danielle, can you tell us uh, what kind of feedback you've been getting from clients? I think that in the beginning, we thought like everyone loved this idea. They loved the idea of being a new uh, alternative. Um, I think it was until clients started realizing that what we're saying and what we're selling is actually really what we're doing. Um, And I think that's a key difference. So clients are now calling us because we are a co-op clients are calling us and thanking us and 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 saying you know what finally it's about time that somebody is taking care of those who are taking care of our loved ones um so i think the feedback has been nothing but positive from all angles can you tell us the size of your operation now danielle how many people work for you and uh, how many clients do you have yeah we have 31 clients and that's averaging between uh peterborough and durham regions um, and we have 18 PSWs. Um, so it, it's just, it grows, it's growing fast. And, and this was a, a story that we featured in a Village Media on a big read. One of our big reads is deeper, deeper dive journalism that we do here at Village. Uh, it came out uh, last week. Uh, it's been read by many, many people already. Are you getting a lot of feedback from people from the, the story? Yes, Um, I have, from the day it it was released, I've had emails after emails, I've had phone calls, way to go, finally somebody's doing this. Um, So it's really affirming because I know that this isn't just a one shot thing for us. This is something that is needed everywhere in every community and people really appreciate the concept. Um, I also think it's something that people have probably thought of like myself, but maybe weren't in a position to be able to leave and start something up. So I'm really, really happy to hear the great feedback from everybody. And the article was so well written that I think it explained the story of this extremely well. Mm -hmm. And um, people, it really hit home for many. That's great to hear. So you're literally hearing from people in other cities saying, I'd like to try to open up one here where I am. I, w- I just got off the phone with somebody from North Bay <laughs> and then reached out. And she's very, very serious. Like she's, you know, she wants to do this. She's got funding for this. Um, so, yeah, it's very real. And I think she knew she wanted to do something very quickly because the need is so, so great. Um, and she read the article and she's like, this is it. This is what you know, I want to do and reached out very, yeah. So we're, we're planning on working with her in hopes that we can help get them started. That's good to hear the power of great local journalism. Simon, where do you, (laughs) where, where do you think we will be with this, uh, 10 years from now? 10 years from now, I'd like to see this as a, uh, amalgamation of cooperatives across Canada. That's what I would like to see. Um, cooperatives work best when they are small community based. So does elder care. So the fit is there. 
if we could get a number of cooperatives working together in a federated co-op structure, we could actually address a lot of the needs of the elders across Canada to stay at home, to live in their home in, in a dignified way. Simon, could we go beyond that one day? Could this be the kind of place where we could have a long-term care facility that is a co-op run place? I mean, is that is that a pipe dream or could we actually see that? I, I think we could see it, but I would like to call it more of a long-term community mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to an institution because our institutional approach, it, it does not work. It, it dehumanizes, um, it, it puts people in a healthcare setting rather than a home setting. Uh, don't get me wrong, what we are trying to do in a lot of the institutions right now, a lot of the workers there, huge hearts trying to care for everyone they can within the situation they've been given. But we need to change that situation and make it more of a multi-generational uh, home care setting. And you know, Simon, I th- we haven't really touched on this a lot in, in this discussion, but, but it really the employees as well, right? We've seen PSWs. It's a very difficult job. Some some PSWs are, are exploited, to, you know, to use the, that, that term. It's a difficult profession. How does this kind of style, the co-op system, benefit the workers? Well, when it comes to the current system, it, PSWs are unregulated. So the profit model basically takes advantage of that. Uh, a lot of women, uh, new Canadians come into the system, uh, hope to get a job. They get a job as a PSW and are exploited for the amount of work they put in, the difficult tasks they're asked to do, uh, and low wages. Uh, we've seen the response from the pandemic uh, that all of a sudden governments are saying, oh, we have to increase the wages of PSWs just to keep them in the system because they keep leaving because of the difficult work and low pay. Changing the dynamic, changing the discussion, uh, allowing workers to have a voice in what their organization does means you're going to change the way the organization values their work and values them. Uh, Danielle, anything that we uh, didn't ask you that you'd like to cover today? Oh, I'm just, uh, I think that this was something that I knew had to happen, and I'm just so grateful that. Uh, the community sees it as something really positive, not just my community, all communities all over are really, you know, responding so positively to this. So I'm just grateful that the awareness is getting out there and people are excited about this because my goal now is to help support, uh, working with Simon, of course, but help support um, other smaller co-ops to, you know, kind of grow and start up in their own communities. Danielle Turpin, co-founder of the Home Care Workers Cooperative Incorporated out of Peterborough, and Dr. Simon Berge, director of the Research Center on Cooperative Enterprises at the University of Winnipeg. This has been a great chat. Thank you both for doing this today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Coming up next on Inside the Village, Frisco and I are going to crack a couple cold ones in support of a great organization out of North Bay. That's straight ahead on Inside the Village. She had my heart. Oh, very nearly. For the latest in in-depth features and enterprise journalism from your local writers at Village Media, be sure to check out The Big Read. The Big Read, it's the full story behind the headlines. Look for The Big Read on your favourite Village Media website across Ontario. So help me, Bob, it's bully in the alley. All right, we're back on Inside the Village, brought to you by True North Mortgage. True North Mortgage, where you get great advice and save a pile of cash. You can uh, find them online at truenorthmortgage.ca. I'm very excited for the new sponsor, Scott, and I'm very excited, too, because I'm told we're going to get some mugs soon. So I'm very excited to have some swag on the table here. The word on the street is the swag is en route, I and wait. I can't wait to display it right here. Right Again, on. it's truenorthmortgage.ca. All right, let's uh, head down the highway to uh, the Gateway City, North Bay, North Bay Pride. Uh, they do some fantastic work uh, in that community. And of course, uh, this being Pride Month, they've teamed up again with uh, Gateway City Brewery, and uh, it's just a fabulous initiative. Yeah, apparently uh, well, the 50 cents from the sale proceeds of this beer go right back to North Bay Pride. They use the money for events and education uh, efforts that they're doing there. And apparently the beer's fantastic, so I hope we're going to get some our hands on some. Joined on uh, the program now by Jason McLennan from uh, Pride out of North Bay. Uh, Jason, welcome to the program. Pe- appreciate you taking some time uh, today to join us. 
Very happy to join you. Now, let's start with the easy question, beer. For the fourth <laughs> year in a row, a local brewery is selling a special beer, a Real Love Golden Lager, to help raise money for North Bay Pride. How did it all uh, come together, and what does that kind of high-profile assistance uh, mean to your group? Well, it actually uh, basically started with Trevor uh, Monahan, who works up at the base, who reached out to them and, and just asked if there was any way of working with them. Um, and it's been a lasting relationship ever since. So every time we sell a beer, uh, 50 cents comes to North Bay Pride to help us with different events and education. And we've even gotten involved a little bit in politics, as you may know. Yeah, I think you had a, you held a debate. Is that right? The Georgian we, we have. Um, we also held a, an Ontario political party debate, too, in Toronto. How did those go? Interesting. <laughs> we need more detail than that, Jason. Yeah. Don't leave us hanging. <laughs> um, it, it's good. It's good. It just it's just a different voice being heard than the usual politics and you know platforms and stuff. So mm-hmm. it's actually kind of nice. So some really good questions came out. Um, especially one about corrections and crisis was really interesting. Mm-hmm. But you know we get a lot of local stuff about you equals you gender affirming. Uh, medical care, that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. it, it was good. It was it, and it was geared towards people opposed to like the bigger picture of, mm-hmm. of everyone. Mm-hmm. So I think you said you get fifty cents for every can of beer they sell uh, of this type of this beer. And specifically, what do you use the money for? How does it help you guys in your events and the stuff you do? Um, it helps us everything from paying for insurance because you know we have to carry five million dollars insurance uh, for every event we do in North Bay. So. There's stuff like that. It, it's uh, production. It's advertising. It's anything um, that we need to pay for. We like to pay our artists an honorarium uh, when we can too. So that's really important, especially our indigenous communities. And we want to make sure everybody's treated f- fairly and equally, and make sure they're part of it. Now, Jason, the uh, the design on the can is uh, is really cool. How did that uh, all come together, and and what's the story behind it? That is completely Gateway Brewery. They uh, made some suggestions to us about what they wanted to do. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever noticed there's actually a shag fly on the can every year, too. Uh, <laughs> that's in rainbow colors. But I think most people overlook that. But it's actually there every year. Uh, it's like a trademark kind of thing we have up here. Um, we've all talked about getting tattoos of the shag fly. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Now, you and I spoke before we got on air. Having been from North Bay, um, I can attest to the uh, pain in the butt that Shad... Have you seen Shadflies? Here school? a little bit, yeah. yeah. You, you, not so much in North you Bay. You have not seen Shadflies till you've been to North Bay. Oh, I'm man. talking blanket buildings, streets. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I mean, Jason yeah. knows what I'm talking about. And if it rains, it smells like fish. It, <laughs> it absolutely <laughs> does. This conversation is going right <laughs> off the rail. <laughs> That's what happens when you bring beer into the yeah, equation. That's right. We haven't even we haven't even had one yet, Jason. <laughs> no, I know. That's, we'll have to send you our mailing address. We're all about free samples here, Jason. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> which not is, a which, yeah, the next obvious question is: Do I have to be in North Bay, or can I order this online? Um, you can actually order it online through Gateway City Brewery, apparently. So, I, I was impressed. All right, we'll be doing that as soon as we hang up. We will, and we'll flash that uh, on screen. Uh, Jason, you've been involved in uh, in North Bay uh, Pride for a long time. Can you talk about the uh, the progress uh, that's been made, uh, the things that have changed for the better over the years? I know we still have uh, a lot of work to do, but uh, what's uh, what's gone on and what's uh, what's changed for the better? Well, I, I think I think people are starting to realize we we are more inclusive now than we used to be because people are getting educated on. Um, LGBT, and it's not just about the LGBT community, it's about everybody, right? So it's really important for people to realize that, you know, we do struggle in some, you know, places. I mean, we've all seen the comments on social media. I mean, people are pretty brave behind a keyboard, but, you know, they they do their homophobic comments. They And the best one is when they go, I'm not homophobic, but... Mm. <laughs> but their comment is, and you try to explain to them why their comment's homophobic, but they just don't get it. But, you know, it's just... I think people are gradually becoming more accepting because it's becoming more, I don't want to use the word normal because it's not really the right word, but it is becoming more mainstream. It's more understandable. And people are starting to relate to the struggles that many people are having in the LGBT community, especially especially the trans community. Um, I can't speak for them specifically, but just in my conversations with trans community, they're so far behind on human rights and, and situations and they face the most violence in the workplace. And, and you know, it's just, and it's just them trying to be their true authentic self, which is, you know, that's definitely the issue. And 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 people need to accept people for who they are, not what they want them to be. 
Can you speak an important point, Jason? Can you speak a little more to that? What are some of the, the, the obstacles that they face? Well, gender-affirming medical care, especially in the North, is definitely a, a huge issue for them. Um, making sure they're getting proper medical care that understands, um, you know, the trans issues around medical care and making sure they're getting the proper treatment and, and the, like everything from physical health to mental health. I mean, it's really a challenge. The further North you go, the harder it is. And not only that, that although, you know, North Bay is growing in acceptance, it's not accepted as much up here as it is in Toronto. So people face discrimination and you know and i you know for the trans community to be out and proud here i you know i could not be more supportive of them and impressed by them because that's a complete brave thing to be to try to change your whole self your outside to match your inside to me is a huge step and very brave to me that's very important what you said and i think too you know we we, we like to celebrate the tolerance that we have in canada and like to pat ourselves on the back and say you know we've done we've come a long way there's a lot of positive things that have changed over the years but we still do have a long way to go uh, and it's, a lot of other countries have a long way to go more more so than we do uh, but what what are the challenges in kind of trying to help the international community come on to the same page that we are <laughs> well funny you mentioned that <laughs> Yeah, amazing timing. There's actually a UN uh, thing we're doing right now to promote um, signing because there's um, the, the UN has a stipulation every year of human rights around LGBT community. And what's happened is, is that some people have left that uh, committee and now there's people sitting on the committee like from Saudi Arabia and the, um, Uganda and those places that are very anti-LGBT. So we're trying to get them to abstain from the vote so that they can continue working towards, you know, equality around the world. But it's still illegal to be gay in 68 countries around the world. And how disturbing is that? I mean, you don't see that fear for anybody straight. Like you can be straight anywhere and not have a problem, but you can't be gay in 68 countries around the world. And people seem to forget that. that, that, And some of those countries, it's the death penalty or life in prison. You know, we we talk, we hear so much about uh, uh, Pride Month being a celebration, but in a way, way, when you hear a stat like that, you realize it is as much a protest still too, isn't it, Jason? It's very much a protest. It is, you know, I I think people forget the grassroots of Pride. Pride is a protest. It was about equality. It was about fighting to be treated equal. Um, It still is. So when people are complaining, you know, about why don't we have a straight pride or why don't that, well, you're not fighting for your rights, your rights to be straight. Like, that's not the issue. The LGBT community and many of them within that, especially marginalized voices and people of color and that are part of the community really do struggle a lot about being equal. And, and you know, I don't want to take my kids to Pride Toronto Parade. Uh, you know, it's still a protest, <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of shock value. I mean, we're a little bit more reserved in the north when we do ours but you know it's it's meant to be shocking it's not meant to be you know it's not the christmas santa claus parade that's my best way to put it that's a good point you talked talk about some of the homophobic negative comments you receive are these things that you that you're getting daily on your group's facebook page i mean how often is this coming <laughs> you know i find it really interesting anytime we try to do something like a debate or we try to do something that's really out of the norm for a pride organization that is when we get the hit with the, the really hate comments well you know what do you know about politics but it's quite shocking when you see like someone like jerry Atrick up there in drag and then moderates a debate and it turns out to be one of the best debates they've ever seen i mean it's funny talking to anthony rota today uh, this morning about something else and And he said, you know, that was one of the most fun debates he's ever had. And he said it was just good enough and it was exciting. And he really appreciated that we actually did that, you know. So and and it's also it's been a challenge to get leaders on board with this concept. Like, you know, they want to do the same old debates with the same old questions. And it's like nobody cares anymore. (laughs) Yeah, I think the answer would be to serve the beer at the debates. You know what? That and edibles, I'm thinking, is the way to go. (laughs) That would make it much more interesting for all of us. <laughs> we've definitely got off the rails. It's one of the best interviews we've ever had on the show, Jason. It's uh, it's 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 funny, Jason, when when you say people comment um, to the effect of you know I'm I'm not a homophobe. That's like saying you know I I don't want to sound like an ass, but I guess if the shoe fits, hundred percent. Right? Like uh, I mean, like what are you going to say next? I have a black friend or I have a gay friend. Like yeah. Okay. 
Exactly. You know, it just gets worse. Yeah. Uh, Jason, just out of curiosity, uh, the the beer uh, it's it's for sale just for Pride Month, or or is it a year long thing? How's that count? No, um, they do it in cycles. So we we they do this whole batch, and then when it sells out, it won't come back till next year. And it has okay. sold out every year within a couple of weeks. So oh, um, it's done very well, and they make more every year. So. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure that we uh, flash the website uh, on screen so that people know uh, where they can get it and get lots of it and make you lots of money, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, we're always looking for sponsors and stuff, too. So <laughs> We and, may order and, the rest. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And this year, we're actually, you know, we got a parade back. We've got all kinds of vendors that can be out now. So it's it's great. We're really looking forward to this year. The best thing that could have happened to you is talking to Frisco and I because we do have a thirst. <laughs> so uh, we'll likely order some. Uh, Jason awesome. McLennan from uh, Pride Out of North Bay. Good luck with this. Uh, keep us posted and thank for, uh, thanks for doing this today. No problem at all. Thank you very much. For the latest in in-depth features and enterprise journalism from your local writers at Village Media, be sure to check out The Big Read. The Big Read. It's the full story behind the headlines. Look for The Big Read on your favourite Village Media website across Ontario. Back to wrap on this episode of Inside the Village, brought to you by True North Mortgage. True North Mortgage, where you get great advice and save a pile of cash. What a great chat with Jason, great initiative, uh, and a terrific guest. And, of course, uh, Simon out of the University of Winnipeg and uh, and Danielle uh, in, uh, in Peterborough. Great show today. Yeah, a lot of positive things, right? We're learning some things that are going to be beneficial to the community, not necessarily uh, a negative thing, which is nice to see. Yeah, and I'm so excited about uh, the great staff at uh, at Sioux Today and Sault Ste. Marie celebrating their 20th anniversary. And speaking of anniversaries, we have one coming up. A huge one. You and I celebrate next week our 10th anniversary, 10 weeks of doing this. That's <laughs> shocking. I still, I still Not only is it shocking, they have yet to find a way to cut us. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. But I guess, uh, you know, a few people are listening. Makes you wonder when the other shoe's going to drop, yep. doesn't it? Yep. InsideTheVillage.ca is where you can find all episodes, of course, uh, across the Village Media Network and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. For Frisco, Michael Friscalati, Editor-in-Chief here at Village Media, I'm Scott Sucksmith. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Number 10. You've been listening to Inside the Village. 